still getting situated. That's my brand, <laughs> mournful and sweet at the same time. That's a good question. I do. Um, sorry, I'm just getting adjusted here. I wasn't totally sure I was going to do this today, and then I decided to do it. So I'm not as set up as I, as I could be. Um, oh, thank you, Richard. Uh, so Marcus says, do you have a practice routine when you first pick up your guitar? Um. I do, but it changes a lot. Um, I don't have one thing that I do every single day, no matter what. Uh, the past week, I've been in a writing mood, so I try to write something the first, you know, when I first pick up the guitar, which is not practicing. Uh, it's music. It's, it's just something that I've wanted to do <clears throat> recently just because I realized I hadn't been writing a lot of tunes and um, I wanted to change that. So I've, I've made writing the, the thing that I do first thing and then I, I'll get into some technical stuff later if I, if I want to or if I have time. Um, a thing, uh, Marcus, that, that I like to do first thing is to play something in a bunch of different keys that connects me to more parts of the guitar sometimes um, gets me into some places where i might have some blind spots uh, simply by playing in an unusual key and also kind of keeps me from just getting i don't know 
in, into autopilot mode. So let's say you're working on uh, triads. Um, seems like something people work on. So uh, I might start with the first string set. Hope you can, maybe I'll tilt this down a little bit. I might start with the first string set and play like that's C major. So um, I try to play that. One thing I'll do is just play it through all 12 keys, C, F, B flat, E flat, A flat, D flat, G flat, or you could say F sharp, B, E, A, D, G, and back to C. That would be one simple thing that you could take through 12 keys. Um, if you're not working on triads, maybe you're working on uh, a lick. So maybe your lick is... So that's a slide. And a pull-off. Play that in 12 keys. You could also try it on different string sets. Uh, so I'm in uh, E now, uh, A, D, G. Now I'll try it one string set lower. Uh, so that's D. So that might be useful. Uh, another thing I'll sometimes do is stay in one key a little bit longer. Maybe use a timer and set a timer for one minute or two minutes or five minutes or whatever and do something in one key for all of that time. So obviously um, it's, it doesn't make sense to play this for two minutes, but I might maybe play all the triads on that string set. In two minutes, I think I could play all the major triads in every inversion on every string set. If the timer is still going, I could do it again. Um, maybe you want to, I, I sometimes do a thing I call animated triads, where it's a triad with with some, some motion in it, like that's two to three, meaning in C major, the two is D, and then go up a whole step to three, that's E. So I'm taking it around the circle of fourths, but you, you could do that in all three inversions. Keep going if you've got more, uh, more neck. Make sure it's, it's clear. That wasn't real clear, really. That's better. So the, I want the moving part to be the loudest thing. It doesn't have to be the loudest thing, but I want it to be the loudest thing. It could be a secret. You know, don't re-attack it. Just do a little hammer on, and then it's a little more of a secret. That'd be something to work on is just which note is sounding the most uh, and can you move it, you know, from one string to the next. Uh, I definitely need some work 
there, uh, I can tell. So that that's a thing that I like to do uh, to answer your question, Marcus, is, is to really get kind of all over the guitar in all the different keys. Um, I usually use the circle of fourths, C, F, B flat, E flat, A flat, D flat, G flat, B, E, A, D, G, C, because I know it and it's convenient because it's something that happens in music. You know, we see things move in fourths. But you could use any order that you like. You could um, randomize it. It doesn't have to be in that order. There's no reason to, to do it that way if you don't want to. Um, some days I need to work on a specific technical thing. Like this, this is more just kind of mapping and connecting and... Uh, some days I work on bending, um, and I find that useful. First thing when I get to the guitar to really track my intonation. So I might use um, a drone. Like um, I use this app sometimes called iShruthi. Let's see if I still have it. I may have moved it off my phone. <laughs> Uh, I can't find it, but you know, go on YouTube and just look for drone. Um, there's cello drones, there's, um, other kinds of things so that you have some pitch reference. Uh, you could use a looper pedal. Um, so let's just say that's my drone thing that's going on. So that's in A. And let's say I'm thinking about A major. find that if I do that, not in every key, but in a few different keys using different drones and really tune into uh, playing in tune, that that's really good for me. Um, I like doing things like that when I first get to the guitar that involve listening. So that there's, I'm not just playing on my own, but I'm playing along with either a drone or a beat or something, even something that's you know, playing along with a record or something, just so that hopefully when you play, you're going to play with people and you want to, um, even in your practice time, find ways to use your ear and play um, in consideration of something else that's that's already happening. Okay, seems like a lot of stuff has come in. Hey, Simone, how you doing? Uh, it has been a long time. Yeah, I can't remember the last time I did one of these. Uh, it's been a while. I've had a lot of stuff going on, um, and uh, everything's cool. But <laughs> uh, I realized today I hadn't done one in a while, so I wanted to join you. Um, let's see. What... Marcus says, I'm with you on that. Right now I'm transcribing bass lines to Bruce Springsteen music for a tribute band. I definitely need to prioritize writing as well. It's a good feeling. I mean, if you practice, um, you're getting better, and that's a long-form thing. Like something you practice today is good for you. Maybe not today, but next week or next month or next year. If you write a piece of music, maybe that's something you could play, you know, with people. And it's it's nice. I find, at least with the people that I play music with, everybody seems to really appreciate when somebody's got a new tune um, rather than just playing the same old songs that we've all played a million times. Um, so people appreciate new music. So that's what I've been into. Uh, Kag Air says, hello, Adam, nice to see you again. What are your favorite pedals and amplifiers regard from Stuttgart? Oh, wow. And a little beer. It's, it's, it's only 1230 here, so it's not quite beer time, but I've got coffee. So cheers to you, Kag. Um, favorite pedals. Let's see. 
I'm I'm a little self conscious because my favorite pedals are not um, not that interesting, really. I mean, I don't think I'm gonna like shock anybody with my cool pedal favorites. But um, for overdrive, I really like the Boss OD3. I think uh, it just sounds honest, and I've used it with lots of different amps. Pretty much always sounds good. I tried using an OD1 a few years ago. I thought I would like it even more than the OD3. And OD1, OD1 just has um, gain and level. And OD3 also has a, uh, a tone control. I thought I would like it without the tone control, but it turned out I, I like the sound of the OD3 better. I don't know if it's got a lot of different stuff in it or just if adding that tone knob in the in the circuit does something that I like but uh, that's my favorite overdrive for just nice uh, overdrive if you want something more adventurous I really like the JHS pedals uh, color box it's got a lot more control on it it's got EQ and it's nothing like a typical guitar overdrive. It's much more like overdriving um, uh, a console, it, it, overdriving a channel in a, in a console, like a Neve channel. It's, ma it's made to be like that. So it's different from, really different flavor from what we think of as overdrive. Uh, but a very useful thing, and, and I like having the, the control over the EQ. So I use that sometimes. Uh, I do I let's see, I'm not using much fuzz these days, but uh, I really like if you like fuzz, I like the Joe Gore cult pedal a lot. Um, I also have R2R. Uh, boost uh, like <clears throat> I guess sort of a treble boost style fuzz uh, made by R2R. That's really good. Um, th the guy who makes those is DJ Lava Lamp uh, on Instagram. Um, for a while, I was using a Hudson Electronics broadcast pedal. That's really cool for overdrive. Uh, to fuzz dirty. I don't know. I, I know I understand that there are differences when people talk about fuzz and overdrive and distortion. Um, I use them maybe a little more loosely than I ought to. Uh, uh, so anyway, take take that if you want. Um, for delay, I really like the old school jam pedals Delay Llama. They have other iterations. They have the Delay Llama Supreme. They have the Delay Llama Extreme, and now they've got a Delay Llama Mark III. Um, I like the, just the original one that they released, you know, ten years ago or something. Uh, it's just a really great functional analog delay pedal. Easy to use. Sounds great all the time. Uh, I also love the old uh, Electro Harmonics Mem Deluxe Memory Man. That's one of the greatest pedals of all time. Uh, I love that thing. I, I use it probably more than I should. It just sounds fantastic. Oh, one other overdrive I want to mention. I forgot because it's new to me. Uh, JHS recently made an overdrive pedal that's very much in the spirit of the... Um, the DOD 250 uh, pedal. It's just kind of raw and dirty, and I find that to be really fun. Most of the time with the overdrive, I am trying to get a sound that I could get with a tweed amp cranked up, which is to say a little bit a little bit compressed, not too compressed, and a little bit kind of wide sounding. That's that's not for everybody, um, but anyway, that JHS overdrive pedal is really cool. Um, reverb wise, I really like the um, what is it? 
Earthquaker Devices makes a pedal called the Ghost Echo. That's just kind of a slightly splashy, weird, dark reverb. I like that a lot. I'm not into the shimmering reverb thing. I know a lot of people are, but it's not what I like. Um, so if you just want something that sounds kind of more splashy, trashy, uh, I think the Ghost Echo is amazing. It really is reactive to your playing. Uh, it makes me feel like there's springs and oil and I don't know what in there. It's, I don't know how they did it. It's, it's a really, really cool pedal. Uh, another pedal I like a lot is uh, the Benson Amps Germanium Boost. It's just a booster pedal, but it's it's really great. I like what it does. If you need to have a boost on your pedal board, and not everybody needs one, but if you if you need to have a booster pedal, that's a really good one. Um, I like having an EQ on my pedal board. I don't have one right now because I had to make room for something else for a particular tour I was doing. But the old Boss GE7. Uh, seven band EQ. That's a great pedal. Really useful. Um, amp wise, uh, in my room right now, I've got two amps that are both Bensons. I've got a Nathan Jr. and a Dizzy Bird. You can't, I'm looking this way because they're on either side of me. Uh, but those are great amps. Uh, I also have a Swart AST Pro that I think is really a wonderful amp. Depends on what you're doing, you know, how much breakup you need, how loud you need to be. I tend to like small amps. Usually, not always. Uh, anyway, Cag, that was a long answer. I hope, I hope you didn't fall asleep during all that. I hope that was useful information. Not using any pedals now. I've just got my guitar going into the Dizzy Bird. Though the Dizzy Bird has a Vinny in. If you are a, if you're if you're into Benson amps, you'll know what I mean. It's got a Vinny in. So I'm not using the reverb of of the um, the Dizzy Bird right now. It has reverb. I'm not using. If you hear reverb. That's coming from the Nathan Jr. So I'm going into the, the Vinny input of the Dizzy Bird into a one uh, out of the head into a 110 cabinet over there. And then I'm taking the output uh, that it's got a direct out and I'm sending that over here to the Nathan Jr., which does have some reverb on it. That's also a 110, that's a combo amp. Sounds really good in the room. I have no idea if it sounds like anything at all on YouTube. But playing through two amps is lovely. Richard Caruso says, I'm gazing long, longingly at my guitar, but we have places to go and things to do, brother. Lo siento, mi casa es su casa. Thank you, Richard. Thank you so much. Uh, Tony, ah, Tony Paiva said something, but then retracted it, so I don't know what was said. Uh, John wonders, have Mason Stoops and I talked about doing another album? We haven't. Um, it's a little harder than it used to be. We don't live in the same city anymore. I now live in New York. And he, he still lives in Los Angeles. So um, doesn't mean we can't do it. It just takes a little more planning. Thank you. 
a song for people in the chat right now just for a moment to remember wow I've never done that compose a song live on the chat. That's a fucking cool idea. Um, all right. Glenn Michael Thompson says, yeah, playing through two amps is great. Um, okay, let me think of, of just a place to start. Um... Okay. I'm going to put my pick down and do this just with my fingers. So um, I just made that up. I started with the idea that I was going to be in B flat and somehow get to G, which <laughs> I somehow did at the end. I really don't know how I did that. I started with just a simple idea. 
And um, there's a little trick there is, okay, I knew I wanted to start in B flat. I just made that up. I could have started anywhere. But let's say you know you want to start on B flat. If, if you're playing a B flat chord, the least interesting melody note that you could play is B flat. Um, so what are the other notes in a B flat chord? They're D. That's more interesting than that. Or play the fifth. That's cool too. But I started on the third, and then I went up to the fifth, but now I've got the third in the bass. So that's just kind of like a, a, a simple composer's trick, which is, you know, not you've only got two notes the way I see it. You've got the melody and you've got the bass, and all the stuff in between is just um, that's really for people who care about harmony. But all the music that you for me, the music that I'm interested in is the melody and the bass, because that's the stuff that's the most, uh, needs the most attention. We need a good melody, we need a good bass line. So as the melody goes up, bass went up, and then this just seems to want a voice lead to the four chord. But I didn't want to keep going, because that's just, all of a sudden I'm using up the whole fretboard. I, I want to, stay in a contained place. That's another composing trick is like, don't show all your cards right away. So so I, I went back down so that I'm not just going up, 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 up. And then I thought I'll keep going down while I'm at it. I mean, that could be A flat sixth or A flat seven. I think I did it both ways when I was ever G minor, and then I just repeated it. It's another composer's trick. Repeat yourself. I went to the four chord for the bridge section or the B section. I do that a lot. A lot of composers do that. Oh no, I went E flat. There's my G chord. That's a second inversion spread G. Uh, you know, I, I want to end the song on G, so I'm kind of hinting at it. It's also got this common tone from the E flat, so it's easy to get to. Um, and then I went back to E flat, but I think it, it might have been nicer to go to A flat the second time instead of. So if the bridge is eight bars, instead of going one bar, two bar, three bar, five bar to go back to that same chord. I think it might make more musical sense to go something else with that G in the melody. And I think I just went up chromatically. Because I knew I had to get back to that B flat and somehow I was, I don't know where I was, but I was down here somewhere. So I just walked my way back up. Sometimes like that's another composer's trick is you, you know you want to get to a certain place at a certain time. So you have to kind of count backwards from there and work your way up to it so that you arrive on time. Uh, if I know the bridge is going to be eight bars, and it doesn't have to be, but that's a common enough size for a tune of this scale to have an eight bar bridge well at the end of those eight bars i got to get back to that b flat so if, if i'm here in bar seven i gotta just figure out you know climb it back up just you know what i mean like it's another composer trick look ahead to where you want to be and set it up so that it looks like like wow how did how did they get back there well you didn't get there by just force of will of going forward you actually peeked around the corner to where you wanted to get to and then drop the breadcrumbs backwards from where you want to be 
Does that make sense? That's how I think of it. So then this last part was just a repeat of the beginning part. Since it's the end, I'm going to repeat that. It's called a tag. When you repeat the last thing a couple times, that's called a tag. And then... Um, just as a kind of way to extend the tag, instead of just going A flat 7 to G minor, I walked all the way down to E in the base of G minor, which you could call E half diminished or E minor seven flat five. And then to E flat minor six. So E, e minor seven flat five, E flat minor six, really common uh, kind of ending thing, which is, so we're in B flat. I went to the sharp four, Minor seven flat five four minor. So we're just trying to get that to happen, which gets us back to B flat. And just I'm putting some melody on top of that. got exactly how I backed myself into that G chord. I'll have to rewind it. But somehow, very much by luck, I did wind up on G when I improvised it. your ear back to B flat so that's the two that's the five sharp five diminished leads us straight to the G something like that that's something about what I did cool um that's a tune what should we call it what should we call that tune you guys all uh Helped me write that. I, I wouldn't have written that any other way. Um, Michael Gorman says, uh, rediscovered Mickey Baker's book one recently. Very good. Yeah, Mickey Baker book one is a classic, one of the all-time classics. If you're trying to learn jazz chord vocabulary, not big, stretchy, wild Alan Holdsworth chords, but just real meat and potatoes useful on a gig tonight uh the mickey baker book is great and has lots of exercises so that you're not just the chords but chord progressions which is cool glenn uh yeah on the spot that's a great that's a great title because that was composed on the spot uh i hope that was insightful um Vita sent a strawberry. I appreciate that. I like strawberries. Um, I don't know. Any any other questions? Just kind of... Uh, that's what really what these office hours are meant to be. Like, I call them office hours, but it's really a Q&A session. Yeah, Blue Coffee Cup Friday. Yeah, this is made by a company, if you guys are into design, uh, this is a company called Not Neutral. Uh, not sponsored or anything like that. I just like their stuff. Um, I've got a bunch of their coffee mugs and drinking glasses, and I think they're really cool. Uh... <laughs> That's nice.
FL, I did not see Adam Neely's recent video on touring. I really like Adam Neely. I've been into him for, uh, oh, seems like a couple of years. I, I really, I like Adam Neely a lot, but I haven't seen the one on touring. Um, tell me what he said, and I'll, I'll tell you what my take on it is, I mean, or how it fits with my own experience. So FL, I'll wait for you to, to, to respond to that. Uh, w William Reed is asking where to start with learning arpeggios if you feel overwhelmed. Um, William, are you looking to play uh, like triadic arpeggios, just in major, minor stuff? Or are you looking in a more kind of jazzy, thing to do like major seven minor seven uh more complex sounds i might approach them slightly differently um please let me know william what what it specifically you're doing with arpeggios and, and then i'll try to answer uh my uh, glenn michael thompson says i just purchased a pair of tubes yesterday long overdue how often would you suggest changing them oh man uh I don't know. Glenn Michael Thompson, that's a really good question. Uh, not often. I mean, I have amps that I, usually when I buy an amp, especially if it's a, if it's a used amp or vintage amp, I'll get it serviced and get new tubes in it, or at least put in new tubes if the technician wants, you know, thinks that's a good idea. And I'll leave them alone really until there's a problem. Like if the amp starts making a weird noise or if it just doesn't seem as loud as it used to. Like if I notice a performance issue, I will um, take the amp in for service. But I don't have like a routine like you might for your strings where like I change strings every X number of weeks or X number of gigs or whatever. I don't, I don't really have that with tube amps. Um, sorry, there, there's probably a more definitive answer to be had. But my personal answer is I only replace them if the amp is uh, seems to need a service. Uh, yeah. Um, okay. So jazz focused arpeggios for William Reed. Um, the thing that I tend to do for arpeggios that feels less overwhelming to me, I hope this is helpful to you, is I play them two notes per string. So let's say G major seven. I could start on F sharp. So that's F sharp, G, B, D. And now I've got a shift, but the, the shape is the same. And now I've got a shift again, but the, the shape is again the same. Could be minor seven. Minor seven flat five. Uh, could be dominant seven. Could be dominant seven flat five. So that's all starting from the seventh. Um, those are the chord qualities basically that we use in jazz. There might be some others, but those are good ones to start with. Major seven, minor seven, dominant seven, minor seven, flat five, dominant seven, uh, flat five. Um, then you can start from the root. That's major.
major seven, minor seven. Uh, dominant seven. Uh, and while you're doing that, I think it would be cool to have some kind of rhythm going, um, either a metronome or a drum loop or something, so that you can start uh, to play this stuff um, in phrases, not just bottom to top and top to bottom, but try to find some phrases. So here's G7. so that you're thinking of, of a real musical context or, you know, have a drone, you know, make a little loop if you have a looper or just find a droney backing track. So then, then you've really got a sense of how each note sounds against the, the G. That's how I would do it. It's two notes per string. I find less intimidating. It's a little intimidating because there's more position shifts. If you're comfortable staying in one area of the neck, this is going to really push you out of your comfort zone. But the mechanics are a little easier because the fingerings repeat, you know. So this is major third, minor third, major third, minor third, major third, minor third. Right, so four frets, three frets, four frets, three frets, four frets, three frets. Much more symmetry to it. So that's what I find helpful. Once you can do the basic arpeggios, the next thing that really makes arpeggios sound a lot jazzier to me would be, excuse me, not building them off the root. So in other words, when you um, have G7, if you play a G7 arpeggio, you're not really adding anything to that conversation. You're just, uh, you know, you say potato, I say potato. It's, it's, it, let's call the whole thing off. It's much more cool and interesting if you do the arpeggio from a third higher. So on G7, I might play B half diminished. So I say a third higher, meaning if G7, if we think of that as like G mixolydian. And so instead of on G, if we start on B, if we stay in G mixolydian, the, the, the chord off, off the third note of G mixolydian is B minor 7 flat 5. That's a G7 arpeggio, but it doesn't have a G in it. It's got A, so it's really a G9 arpeggio with no G. That's much more hipper. Um, if you want a flat nine sound, you could play B diminished against G7. Again, there's no G in there. That, that's the next level, but you're trying not to get overwhelmed, and I'm already probably telling you more than you need to know. But that's something to put, you know, on your music stand for next month or next year or whatever. It's like get your basic arpeggios down, then start to think about, you know, playing a third above. G, if it's G minor 7, you could play B flat major 7.
sounds. Okay, a lot more stuff. Uh, Vitus says, do you think learning bare hair scale of chords is useful for songwriting? I don't know. I really don't know uh, very much about Barry Harris, to be honest. Uh, I've watched some videos on YouTube. I never got to study with him directly. I understand the basic ideas, I think, but I've not played with them in terms of songwriting. I mean, why not? Uh, right? Like, sure. But but I, from personal experience, I, I don't know. So sorry, I don't have a, a story to tell there. Uh, FL said he was talking about how his band Sungazer nearly lost $17,000. I thought there were a lot of risks linked mainly to COVID, and many seemed uh, to materialize, perhaps inexperience of tour planning. Um, okay, so I, I'm going to just shoot from the hip here. I haven't seen this Adam Neely video. I'm just going by uh, what FL is telling me here. But um, it is very easy to lose money on tour. Uh, I don't know the details of Sun Gazer's tour or where that $17,000 went. But um, COVID is currently happening. I mean, I'm recording. This is a live stream. It'll be I'll archive it so people might watch this in the future and go, COVID, what's COVID? But right now, COVID is a real thing. Shows get canceled, and it's beyond our control. And generally, when the show gets canceled or postponed, you make nothing. So you might be counting on a show next week that is suddenly not happening, and there's suddenly less money coming in, but let's say, for example, the rest of the tour dates are still happening. Well, you can't go home in between just because you have this one night off. So you've still got to, even if you skip this place, you've got to drive from here to here. So you still have to put all that gas in the car. You still have to stay in a hotel, uh, et cetera. So, so that's a, a real danger that could happen right now is COVID. Um, also, I mean, you have to sell merchandise, really, because what the venues are going to pay, eventually you can get to a higher level where you are headlining at a major theater and you can put butts in those seats. And um, if you're selling out a venue, whatever the size is, if, whether it's 50 people or 500 or 5,000 or whatever, if you're selling the place out, um, you're in a much better position to make money. So one of the big dangers in, in touring, I think, is just playing places of appropriate size. I don't know what size places Sun Gazer is playing, but uh, whatever size venue you think you can play with your band, be conservative in your estimate. Don't try to book yourself someplace where you can't possibly uh, sell it out. Otherwise, because um, a, a lot of places, if you, if you sell the place out, you get not just, you know, X number of seats times the price or whatever, but you get a little extra if it's sold out. So that's what you want to do. Uh, over and above that, you've got to sell merchandise because if you've it's just everything is so expensive now. Hotels are expensive. Gas is expensive. Flights are expensive. Meals are expensive. Um, it may not be enough to make the money that the venue is going to pay you. So you have to come up with ideas for merch that are stuff that people really want. Whatever it is, T-shirts, hats, beer koozies, uh, coffee mugs, whatever. Anything that you can think of um, that you can sell, um, you know, try to get to know your audience and think of what they might want and then put your name on it and sell it. Uh, and then don't be shy about it. If you've got uh, boxes of T-shirts in your van and they're for sale at the show, I've seen a lot of bands make this mistake. They they bring the merch, they set it up in the in the 
in the lobby or whatever. But they never say from the stage, hey, we have these awesome t-shirts. Uh, check them out. I'll be out at the at the t-shirt place. I'll be there signing, talking to people. I know during COVID, some artists don't want to go out and sign shirts or hats. Or they, you know, they're just trying to keep their distance from people. But as a general principle, people are there to see you. And if after the show you just hang out in the dressing room and, and eat chips and drink beer, they're not going to be that interested to talk to your merch person about anything. Um, if they love you, they might buy a t-shirt just because they're happy to put 20 bucks in your, in your gas tank. But it's, you're going to have much more success uh, if you're out there because that's, they love you. They may, may or may not love your t-shirts, but they love you. That's, they're already there. They've proven that. So, Make cool merch and then sell it. Mention it multiple times on stage that that you know you, you're excited about the merch. You want them to be excited. People buy some stuff. It's really essential. Um, other than that, everything else is just kind of basic economics. You know, um, have breakfast at a cheap place, not an expensive place. You know, go to Waffle House or whatever. Uh, don't, you know, uh, stay at a hotel. It might mean that you wind up staying at hotels that aren't in the center of town. Like the, the band probably would be stoked if you stayed at a hotel that's in the center of town, that's near stuff, that's just in a cool location. But usually, you know, hotels by the airport are a lot cheaper or a hotel 50 miles out of town is going to be cheaper. So, it's kind of a bummer for the band because you wind up staying at a hotel that's not near anything cool. But if if the point is to make money, you just have to, that's what you do. So yeah, there's lots of places you can lose money on tour. Even if you're smart um, and resourceful, I think, I think what you have to do is tour hard and lose money for a long time until you develop enough of a fan base to where um, that starts to shift. But if you just go out and play a few shows this year and play a few shows next year, it's hard to build a following anywhere. This may be changing now because we're – you know, people build followings in other places. They build followings on on social media or whatever. So it may, it may be that, you know, you could go anywhere because you've got a million TikTok followers and you could show up and sell out uh, a nice size theater. Uh, but that generally hasn't been the case in, in the years of my own uh, touring and stuff. It was more, you know, about getting on the radio and getting in the newspaper. Maybe that stuff doesn't matter as much now. But I do think it is true that the more you go through the same uh, cities in a cycle, you know, we played Atlanta this year. We're going to play Atlanta next year. We're going to play Atlanta next year, you know, and, and so on times of multiple cities to where you figure out where you have the most traction and just keep building those places. If you just go to Atlanta once and nobody shows up, you can't just go, well, I guess we're not going to play Atlanta. If that's a city that you want to build in, you build it and build it and build it and build it. Um, that's my take. Um, hope that's helpful. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, I'm having problems with building the good phrases because I'm tone deaf. After 10 years of, this is a Simone, uh, I'm tone deaf. After 10 years of playing guitar, despite lots of practice, I still don't recognize pitches easily, and it's frustrating. Do you have anything to recommend to get over this problem? Simone, that's so tough. You're That's that's almost impossible, what, what you're trying to do. I admire that you're trying to do it. That's awesome. Um, but if you're genuinely tone deaf... Um, that's hard that you're asking you're trying to figure something out that you might never be able to figure out in in a way that you could if, if you weren't tone deaf uh but 
what I would try to do is um, then maybe don't worry about tone so much. I mean, tone, I don't mean tone like EQ, but uh, tone like pitch. And wor th not worry about, think about phrasing with regard to rhythm. Um, da, 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 da. So I'm thinking um, this rhythm just came into my head, and I'm going to do it on the note uh, D. Now I'm going to do it in octaves. Try a different rhythm and some different pitches. Ba, 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 ba. Ba, 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 ba. One note at A. Now two notes. Should have kept that long. Ba, 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 ba. Ba, 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 ba. Almost didn't make that one. And so on. So start, uh, instead of trying to, to, to play lines and chord tones and whatever you're trying to get to with your practice, just think like a drummer and uh, just think about rhythm and phrasing has so much to do with rhythm. And don't even think about, uh, you know, chord tones or arpeggios or anything like that. Just focus on rhythm for a while. Uh, I hope it's not 10 more years of, of that. I hope you get to where you want to be sooner than another 10 years. But um, if you're not focusing on rhythm, you're missing a big part of phrasing. And already you've proven to yourself that practicing and trying to think about stuff melodically has just been frustrating. So just think about rhythm. Uh, I tend to think about horn lines. Good afternoon, Mr. Levy. Thanks, Mr. Ackerman. Uh, yeah, horn lines are great. Um, but I think in Simone's, Simone's case, I would even just take pitch out of the equation for right now and just think about rhythm. I, I was trying to get you to two notes because it just starts to make it a little more interesting, but you could play on one note for a while and and work a lot with that and just think about rhythm. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, that's what I would do. Go on YouTube and and try to find some like basic stuff about rhythm. It doesn't don't try to study with some master drum teacher who's going to show you a bunch of complicated stuff. Just find some real simple stuff that you could do, um, you know, beginning drum thing, and see if you could translate that to the guitar. So really try to take pitch out of the equation. Uh, Aaron Davis. Hi, Aaron Davis. Um, if I agree, I always try to buy merch, extra revenue for the artist, souvenirs for fans. Sometimes... I think that people forget, as someone said years ago, it's the music business. Thanks for answering. Yeah. Yeah. I've Years ago, I was playing a solo acoustic show at this little folk festival. And, uh, I mean, this is, to me, a really great example of, you know, the, we're in a business. Uh, a guy was playing his songs, and then he was selling CDs. I think the CDs were $10. So that gives you an idea of how long ago this was. Uh, but let's say it was $10. And the guy's pitch was like, hey, uh, I'm selling CDs. They're $10. You know, just remember, you're going to have the CD a lot longer than I'm going to have the $10. And um, 
I thought that was really funny and also really brilliant and really true. If you're on a tour and you sell your CD for $10 or whatever, it's going to go straight into the gas tank. You know, you're going to need that $10 to keep the tour moving. If that person doesn't buy a CD, even if, you know, somebody could argue, well, the co- it only, this is only like a dollar's worth of plastic. Why, why should I pay 10 or 20 or $30 for a piece of plastic that costs a dollar? Um, like you said, it supports the artist. Also, they're going to have that music for a lot longer than you're going to have that money. I live in New York City. If you give me $30, it's not going to last very long, even if I'm not on tour. Just living day to day in New York City, um, uh, money just goes like that. So, yeah, if you can support your favorite artists uh, when they come to your town, please do. Uh, if they sell their music on Bandcamp, that's a great place to buy people's music better than Spotify or Tidal or Apple Music or whatever. Bandcamp, more money goes directly to the artist. If they're doing a live stream and you can put some money in the tip jar uh, to support them, uh, that it's so helpful. Yeah. Uh Tadashi Jinhua says, how should I deal with parents' conflicts? A great question. I really don't know how to answer it. I'm sorry. My parents, uh, lucky. I'm very lucky. My parents were supportive that I played music, and I didn't have to deal with that. I don't have a good answer for you. I'm really sorry. Uh... Rich Ackerman says, one note samba. Exactly. Learn to play one note samba. Perfect. The bridge is a little harder, but it's just scale. Right? It's just scales. That's not that hard. Um, Good call, Rich. I like that. Alan Berry, I still have the first CD I bought in 1988. Any chance of future duo gigs with Jim Campolongo? I saw you and Jim a few times at 55 or a few years back, and the music was beautiful. Alan, thank you. Um, I, I don't know. I, I love Jim. He is a dear old friend. We've known each other since uh, not quite 30 years, but something close to that. We both used to live in San Francisco. And we uh, both moved to New York, and we've made a lot of music there and here. I don't know. We No, we don't have any plans to play together again. Um, uh, but I would love to. So maybe after I get off of this uh, office hours, I'll reach out to Jim and suggest that. Uh, that's a good idea. Uh I'm going to sign off. It's It's been a while. It's I've been here for a little more than an hour. Uh, I know there's a lot of, of you here who just got here, but um, I'm going to call it a day for now. Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. And um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do another one of these soon. I don't usually ask for any money or anything, um, but if you want to support these uh, office hours that I do, um, there's links, uh, when I, when I share these, uh, oh, I guess I could put it here. Yeah. Could put it in the chat here. If you want to check out any of the stuff that I'm doing, uh, YouTube doesn't want to let me do that. Gosh darn you, YouTube. Are you going to let me do it? Yeah, it's not going to let me do it. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, If you want to support these office hours, I've got a Patreon channel called Guitar Tips Pro. Uh, I've got records for sale on Bandcamp. Um, I've got a Yurt Rock baritone guitar loops uh, pack. I've got courses on True Fire. If you just want to send me something, uh, you could Venmo me at Adam Levy Guitar. 
no pressure. I, I really mean to give these away for free. But since you were asking about losing money on tour, I lost uh, three shows this week that I was supposed to play because um, you can't see it, but I've got my foot in a boot. I hurt my foot. I'm fine. It's not broken, but I had to... Um, I'm not, there's three gigs this week that I was, I was supposed to play that I'm not able to do. So um, that's loss of real income. It has nothing to do with COVID. It's just my own, uh, it just is what it is. So if you feel like supporting, you could buy something I've made. You could just send me a little money on Venmo, whatever. If you can't do that, that's fine. I hope to do another one of these soon. And I appreciate all of your questions and um, sharing and being part of the guitar community. It's it's generous of you all to, to be here and share your own uh, curiosity and your own experience with other players. I think that's really cool. Okay, thanks everybody.